Oh, there is a name I love to hear, I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how... Hey guys, what are you laughing at? I was jamming with some... T- I was playing it too loud, was I? No. You didn't hear it, did you? No. Could you hear I know you heard me say... You heard me or you heard my tunes? You heard me. Did you hear my tunes? Yes. No. Why not? Because you were, you were wearing earphones. I know. I had them on, and sometimes you can hear. Sometimes we turn the music up really loud, and you can. What? Not plugged in. Oh. That's probably why I sounded so bad. Because I didn't have music to sing with. But I got my earphones, so I can, I can jam, right? Why? Why? Oh, it has to be plugged in? No, you need a what? phone, though. What? Oh, I need my phone. Man, I, I, I don't have my phone. So I could plug this into a phone? Could I plug it into something else? A computer. A computer. Oh, I could do that. My laptop. Yeah. What else? What else could I plug it into? A laptop. Oh, an iPad. That's right. Do you guys ever remember an iPod? Yeah, I'll bet I could plug it in there too, right? Yeah. You know, really, this looks kind of silly, doesn't it? Sitting here with singing and, and, and telling you, and there's nothing there. You know what? I'm going to tell you what this is like. Because these phone, these are good phones. When I'm on the airplane, I can watch a movie and plug it in and, and listen to the volume on it. Otherwise, it's just a picture that's going, and I don't really work. So, so, but this, is, this, this reminded me of something. I was in my office, and I'm looking at my desk, and I saw them. And I didn't have anything to plug it into. And I thought, well, what good are these? It reminded me. My Bible was sitting right next to it. Because as a believer, as a Christian, we call ourselves Christians, but we never come to church. We never go to Sunday school. We never read our Bible. We never pray. Well, what makes us a Christian then? I know that Jesus is in my heart, but I have to be plugged in to learn about God. If I just if I just call myself a Christian, it's just like me wearing these. If I never read my Bible, if I never pray, I never help people, it does no good at all. David tells us in the Psalms, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does that mean? That means we need to learn God's word. We need to be plugged in to God's Word. Otherwise, we're just a really nice piece of equipment that has no value at all. You can be the best-looking Christian, the best-dressed Christian by name, but if it's not Jesus in your heart and if you're not plugged in to doing, listening, reading what He says, we just look like we're a bunch of silly people. Let's pray. Father, help us to teach what it means to be plugged into you. Let us teach them by our words, but our actions also. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Page 547. Big Red Book 547. 547. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean How marvelous, how wonderful And my song shall ever be How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love.
love for me me it was in the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own griefs but sweat drops of blood for mine how marvelous how wonderful and my song <coughs> how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me When with the ransomed in glory His face I last shall sing Will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me How marvelous, how wonderful And my song shall ever be how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. All right, Kayla's going to play number 426 for us. 426. <clears throat> I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sins and won the victory. <clears throat> victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. I made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. <clears throat> And then I cry, dear Jesus, heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is due him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood i heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and I heard about the streets ago beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus. My Savior forever, He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is due Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. You can't play it no better than that.
One of these days, I hope my preaching can match her playing. <laughs> Some of you are going, <laughs> that was us too. Ezekiel. We're going to look at Ezekiel 2 and 3, but I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 3. As you're turning there, I want to remind you, by the way, today is the 21st anniversary of 9-11 don't know whether you remember or realize that or not. I didn't until yesterday, but uh, literally 21 years ago, all of our lives were changed in a way that's never been able to go back. Today is also, if you are a grandparent, stand up, please. I want you to look at this. This is amazing. Grandparents, this is Grandparents Day. So if you are a grandparent, you look at all these others that are around here, you're responsible for that. Congratulations. Thank you. Give yourself a hand. Happy Grandparents Day. Um, there are a few revival flyers out in the foyer. Revival does start this evening. Tonight only, 6 o'clock. We're keeping our regular Sunday night time. At 6 o'clock, it will be 6.30, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evening, 6.30. Uh, there are some themes that are there. Tonight is Family Challenge, Pack a Pew, uh, Bring Your Family. Robbie has got a head start on us. Actually, Robbie, Joanne, and Jerry have got a head start on us. If you did not realize, uh, Robbie, Jerry, Joanne, this is uh, their brother Clay's family. They set the headstone or had a Celebrations headstone was set out to the cemetery and family came in and, and to all of you, we want to welcome you to Lee Choir Baptist Church. Some of you, this is kind of home anyway, but welcome back. We are so glad that you uh, have, have come to be here with us today. I wished it could be any other circumstance, but we'll give Robbie credit for packing two pews already today. Wow. But family pack a pew after church tonight. We are going to have a fellowship. Uh, Clint and his wife April will be here. Uh, back in the back we'll have fellowship. There'll be, I think, desserts, cookies, cake. If you have cookies you want to bring, bring them up tonight before church. Set them back in the kitchen. Uh, then Monday night is old time night. Dress in your duds from yonder years. Beans and cornbread at 555 or 545 will be serving. Tuesday night, it'll be walking taco night and bring a friend night. So you have between now and Tuesday night to make some friends. I want to encourage you to do that. Bring them to church, but we'll be having walking tacos. And when Wednesday night is going to be our youth and uh, kids night. At 545, we'll be having Frito chili pie or a chili dog. Come Rocky Ridge Revival, we'll be doing music tonight and tomorrow night, right, Jared? Okay, tonight and tomorrow night, and then the Alversons will be here Tuesday and Wednesday evening doing uh, music. Uh, we had a bunch of Bella baby bottles that were put out on the table last month. Uh, we've already had five or six of them that have come back. When you get the bottle filled with your change, bring it back and just set it on the table and, and early if you see them, grab them and take them back. Erlene is our latest volunteer. We, we have so many clients now, we have had to start calling in some volunteers to help. We've hired an additional staff person also. Uh, but fill it with change, put it back on the table, or if you're in Stigler Tuesday or Thursday, 9 to 1, the Bella office is usually open. You can drop it by there. Uh, Ellen McMillan, our state missions offering is going on this month. Our church goal is $500. Uh, envelopes are out in the foyer, some in the offering plate. If you'd like to give toward that, I want to encourage you to do that. And then ladies, Bible study, no Bible study this week. When you resume the next week, it will be 19 and 20. 19 through 22 of 2 Samuel. Yes, Jill. Ladies helping with the revival dinners. Short meeting down front after church. Jill promised it would be short. You know what it means when the preacher says short. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. I'm excited that all of you are, are, are here today. I have been praying for this, this revival that starts tonight since June. 
uh, want to ask you just just make plans to be here and invite, invite, invite. This morning, I want to look at Ezekiel chapter 2 and, and, and 3, but I want you to turn to Ezekiel 3.16. That's where I want to start at. This is the first of two instances where Ezekiel is called to be the watchman on the wall. It came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth. Give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does turn, or does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. And again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, I lay a stumbling block before him. He shall die. Because you did not give him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he surely shall live, because he took warning, and also you will have delivered your soul. Then the hand of the Lord was upon me and said to me, Arise, go out to the plain, and there I shall talk with you. We see Ezekiel. It opens up where he is at the river Chabar, and he has that vision in chapter 1. The wheel within the wheel, the fire, the four, four uh, cherubim that were there, the faces that are on them. He is given that vision and he is set down. And he falls on his face and he ponders all that he has seen. All that he has seen. When you look at chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's actually seven things that come to mind, but most of them happen in, in, in the early verses of chapter 2 that lead to that watchman on the wall. That he must proclaim God's word. Well, let me share with you a few things that happen, and then we're going to get to that proclamation of God's word. In verse two or verse one of chapter two, Ezekiel, after this vision that he has had, and his it's literally his call, his call to go and be a prophet to the people. That call to be a prophet to the people. Ezekiel, not sure what has happened, and do I want to do this? But in verse 1 of chapter 2, he heard one speaking and said to him, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. He must know that he is the son of man. He knows that he is weak and it is God who is speaking to him. This title, Son of Man, will be used throughout Ezekiel in God's Addressing and speaking to him. The second thing that we see is he must arise and listen to God. The Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet and I heard him who spoke to me. Ezekiel has witnessed this, this vision at the river Chabar and it has left him what I called, Bob, weak need. His knees were knocking. He was weak. He could, let me tell you, if you ever have an experience where you are standing in the presence of God, you will fall. You will be weak need. You will not have the strength to stand. And with that, God knew and He sent the Spirit and it says, The Spirit entered me and set me on my feet. When you get ready to go do God's work, make sure it's the spirit that's in you that's going forth. And remember, if it is truly something that God has called you to do, you cannot do it in your power and your might. Because if you could, God wouldn't be calling you to it. 
He's calling you to it. He will strengthen you and set you on your way. But we see thirdly, thirdly in, in verse, verse uh, 2 also it says, He must receive and be filled, empowered by God's Spirit. He must arise in the Spirit and listen to the Lord. And then he has to be empowered by the Lord. I heard him who spoke to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious people that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. He will receive the word. He will be filled with the Spirit. And he must go and share God's word. You know what the most frightening thing for a believer is? Well, outside of the preacher calling on you to pray in church, that's probably the most frightening while you're in church. But I believe the most frightening thing for any Christian is outside when God calls you to witness to someone. And we have that fear and, 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 and intimidation because, number one, what if I say the wrong thing? Number two, have I said and will I say the right thing? And number three, and I believe this is the biggest one, they know me and I haven't measured up to what God wants me to be. What if I go to them and they say, who are you to tell me I know your life? I know where you've been. I know what you've done. Some of you are shaking your head. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And that's why it's important for us to live a godly life every single day. That's why I believe revivals are important for us today is because we need to hear from someone else about what God requires of us. And that we have sin in our life and we need to repent. He tells him further in verse 4. These people that you're going to, they're rebellious. They're the very people that God has chosen. Israel, not only are they rebellious, so are their fathers. They have transgressed me, even to this very day. Do you know what this means to Ezekiel when he's saying to this very day? In 597 B.C., Ezekiel was taken in the second captivity, the second wave of, of Nebuchadnezzar coming in and bringing a, a, a conquest against Judah, against Israel, and now he is being taken out as a captive to a land several hundred miles from where he lives at. And that's where he's going to spend the rest of his life. And he knows that he is there because of the sins of the people. And now God's telling him as if the captivity wasn't bad enough. As if taking captive and, and being led to another people in another land. You don't speak their language. You don't know their cultures. You don't know the street names or anything else. You're there and that's bad enough. But he's saying, and they're still sinning. Now, don't you think if you lived during the time of Ezekiel, just being taken out of the city, you watch part of it being conquered, you're removed from your people, and you're put into a land to settle, a government, a people, traditions you don't know, would that not get your attention? And you would be going, wow, I think I really need to relook my decision-making paradigm and I need to look at my life and I need to get in tune with God. But yet the people were just like, just like the children's sermon. They had their earphones in, but they weren't listening to God. They were still continuing in their sin because Ezekiel said, their fathers have sinned and even them up unto this very day. They are impure, or excuse me, impudent, stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord. 
As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are like a rebellious house, yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. He's telling them, you're going to go and you're going to say these words to them. They're not going to like it. Some may listen, most may not. Most may not. You know, I'm just sitting here thinking God's calling Ezekiel to his prophetic ministry. And God's telling him, you're going to go out and you're going to be the Billy Graham and you're going to win them all and it's going to be good. No, he's telling them, you're going to go out and they are not going to listen to you. It's like that little kid where he's going, not listening, na, 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 na. Matter of fact, Ezekiel goes to him and they did to him the same thing they did to Jeremiah. He says, thus saith the Lord. And they said, God didn't tell you that. Listen, I'm here today and I'm here to proclaim to you that thus saith the Lord, it's appointed for every man once to die and then the judgment. You're going to die and you will be held accountable and you will either spend an eternity in heaven with a God who loves you because you accepted His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior, or you will spend an eternity separated from Him in a sinner's hell because you refused. And I know... There are other churches, other pastors, other people that will tell you that's not what God's Word says. Jesus loves you and in the end we all get saved. All roads lead to God and we're all going to go to heaven. God would never condemn anyone and send them to hell. May I tell you something? That theologian that made that comment was full of hogwash. That is not what God's Word. And if you want to hear that message, you can go out and find it today. But you will not hear it in this place. So here's Ezekiel. He's going to a people that he's not sure he wants to and God says, and by the way, most of them aren't going to listen to you anyway. But you know what? Sometimes that's how we are. We tell people about Jesus and they just, eh, listen, if you're going to go do that preachy stuff, just hush. Just don't even start with me. I believe what I believe. Well, I'm glad that you do. I'm sorry you're wrong. Now, that may not be the best approach, I admit. But I'm going to tell you, if we don't start getting serious about telling people what the end is going to be, we're going to see a lot of people spend an eternity in a sinner's hell and regret it, and there is no return once you're there. Spent too long on that point. Not only, not only are they going to reject him, but they are also going to... I lost my place here. Give me a second. He's going to be opposed. Look at verses 6 and 7, three different times. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are, wi are with you, you dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid by their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. They had rebelled against God to such an extent the entire nation was considered rebellious. They had transgressed against Him down through the centuries, even from the birth of the nation with Abraham. They were impudent, obstinate, hard-hearted, totally unwilling to repent. And not only that, they were going to, Ezekiel was going to face persecution. Some people would use his own words against him. Son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor afraid of their words. Their words would ridicule, would mock, would scorn him. Some would prick him like thorns and briars, tearing his flesh, attempting to harm him. They would literally cause physical persecution against him. Others would sting him like scorpions, threatening him with death imprisonment, poison his ministry, and even to the point of trying to take his life. Boy, doesn't that sound like the place you want to sign up at 
Can you imagine that on a recruitment poster? I mean, imagine this. Come be a member of Lee Choir Baptist Church and people are going to make fun of you. People are going to beat you. People are going to call you names. People are going to throw you in jail. People are going to... I wonder how many people would still come to Lee Choir Baptist Church. And yet this was Ezekiel because he had a message that he had to proclaim. But to do this, Ezekiel had to... Ezekiel goes now into the learning part. He had to eat. He had to devour and digest God's word. In verse 8 it says, But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Now, when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was on it. Then he spread it out before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mourning. There was a scroll that was there, and that scroll was so full that God had explicitly put his word on it, and, and because it was so full, there was no room for your adding to or taking away. Your opinion did not matter. Ezekiel's opinion did not matter. He was to take this and he was to eat this. And on it were the lamentations and mourning and woe. What do those three mean? That was the judgments that were getting ready to come. As if the judgment of deportation in 597 and 605 were not enough. There was one more that was coming. That judgment that was coming was going to be the total destruction of, is of Judah in 586 B.C. A total destruction in that many people were killed, the walls were torn down, the temple was burnt, the houses that had any significance at all were burned, and there was a small remnant, very small remnant that was left. They either were left because they were not killed or they were not found worthy to take in the deportation. Judgment is coming. Now, Ezekiel, take this word and eat it. Can I give you an interpretation of what I think this means? We are all to take and digest God's word. We are to eat God's word. And it is going to be sweet. How do I know? Because he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth. He caused me to eat the scroll. He said, Son of man, feed your belly. Fill your stomach with the scroll. So I ate it and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. I love reading God's word. I, I literally love reading God's Word. I don't understand all of it. I'm still a student of the Bible after 30 years. I don't understand all of it. But when I do get an understanding, it means that much more to me. It is so sweet. I love, I love the theme of the New Testament, Jesus loves me. God loves me. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love that, that, that theme of love that is there. In the New Testament, it's called agape love. In the Old Testament, it's called hesed love. And it tastes sweet. We read the Word of God and it tastes sweet. But we know also that as it hit His stomach, it was no longer sweet, but it turn bitter. Just as John was told to eat that scroll. Do you know what the bitterness of God's word is? We all want to hear God loves the world. We all want to hear about eternity. We all want to hear about forgiveness. But we don't want to hear the words unless a man confess with his mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in his heart. He shall be saved that God raised him from the dead, he shall be saved. We, don't, we, we want to hear that part, but we don't want to do it. It's bitter when we have to live. It's one thing to read the words of God, but when we got to live the words of God, we, we have two highway patrolmen in our, in our service today. And, and, and you know, guys, I read that speed limit sign that says 55, 65. I know full well what it says, but I don't want to drive 55 or 65. I think that road, I think I can drive 80 on that and I can be okay. Now, nobody will ride with me. But do you want to know when that turns bitter? It's when I see those lights 
flashing in the mirror. That's when the bitterness comes. We may not want to do what the Word says, but the Word of the laws of our land are there for our protection. The law of God, the words of God, are there for our salvation. If the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Can I get an amen? amen. You're wrong. The Bible says it, and that settles it. What you believe is immaterial. Unless it agrees with the Word of God, you're out of the will of God. I set you up, I know. We have to believe and we have to live that Word. So he goes on and says, Son of Man, verse 4, chapter 3, Go to the house of Israel, speak my word with my people, the words to them. For you are not sent to a people, unfamiliar speech, hard language, but of, to the house of Israel... Not to many people of unfamiliar speech, of hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. But the house of Israel will not listen to you because they will not listen to me. For the house of Israel are impudent, hard-hearted. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces, your forehead strong against their foreheads. Like adamant stone, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they are a rebellious people. I want to share something with you on this one. It's easy for us, easier for us to go to Africa and share with someone the Word of God. It's easier for us to go out of state, out of country, to share the Word of God than with our own people. With our own people. And, and he's telling Ezekiel, listen, if I were to go to send you to the people in the land, you don't know their language, you don't know their customs, you don't know anything. If you could speak to them, they would be more willing to surrender and follow you than your own people who know the law, who went to the, the, the temple, who know what they're supposed to do, and they're going to reject you. i got to tell you, if there's something, church, if there's something today, right here it is. Right here it is. We are the third, moving closely to the third largest lost nation in the world. We have more churches. We have more pastors. We have... All the opportunities, and yet people today are stubbing their noses. No, I don't want to hear that message. No, that's not what I believe. No, that's not what I want to hear. We have become a rebellious people. We have hardened our hearts. We have become impudent. We have heard the pastor say, Thus says the Lord. And we say, Amen, when we need to be looking at ourselves. We're too busy looking at the sins of everyone else to look within our lives and see what our sins are. And believe me, until you get your sins, your life, right with God, people are never going to listen to you and take you serious well you see it's just a little sin I just have this little pet sin can I tell you something there's people that have pet alligators there's people that have pet snakes there are people that have pet lions there are people that have pet tigers and do you know what happens to some of those people it turns on them that alligator bites them that lion slays them that snake strangles them because that animal is doing what that animal has a nature to do. An animal nature. You think you can tame your sin, and you're wrong. And in God's eyes, there is no little sin. So whether, whether you are drinking whether you are abusing your body, whether you are addicted to pornography, whether you are selling yourself out to sexual immorality, whether you are abusing your body with foreign substances, I don't care if the state calls it legal all they want, if God's word says it's wrong, the state will never make it right. God's word is the final say. And today we have let the world dictate to us, even as the church, and believe that lie, I am okay. Let me read on. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, receive into your hand, verse 10, receive into your heart all my words that I may speak to you and hear 
with your ears and go. Get the captives to the children of your people and speak to them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or whether they refuse. He's telling them, go preach to them. Tell them the truth. Whether they accept or not is up to them, and more than likely they won't, but I am calling you to tell. Then the Spirit lifted me up. I heard behind me a great thunderous voice. Blessed is the glory of the Lord from this place, or from his place. I heard the noise of the wings of living creatures uh, that touched one another, the noise of the wheels. So the Spirit lifted me up, took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit. He's saying, I didn't want to go. Ezekiel saying, I didn't want to go. But God lifted him up and took him, and he went. Then I came to the captives of Tel Aviv, who dwelt by the river Chabar, where all of this started at. And he said, I sat there and remained there astonished among them seven days. And after seven days, you look, God gave him the message. God gave him the message. And here's the bottom line. You're going to preach, and you're going to preach to the ones that are out there. If you don't, listen, you're here today. You're here today. My message to you today is this. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And He will forgive you of your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But you have to ask. And we're too proud to do that. We think we're okay. We think we're living a good enough life without Him. We think we make all these excuses. And I have a responsibility to tell you. Clint Sinclair coming this evening has a responsibility not to this church but to God Almighty to tell you this. You are a sinner and you will spend an eternity in hell without Jesus Christ. You will get exactly what you want. Leave me alone, God. I'm doing fine on my own. He will. And Clint will declare that to you, whether you like it, whether you agree or not. And if we don't, you will. It does not change your judgment. Your judgment is still the same, but the blood of your judgment will be on my hands because I didn't tell you. But if I tell you and you don't repent, then it is on you and I am free and clear. However, if you accept, if you are here and to say, yes, I am, a, I am a sinner. Yes, I know I have sin in my life. Yes, I am David. I have strayed away from the will of God and I need to move back. Restore to me, God, the joy of salvation. If you're ready to do that, we're going to have an invitation in a few minutes and you get the invitation to come and ask God to forgive you of your sins. To say, yes, Jesus, I believe you are God's son. Yes, you died for my sins. You are Lord of my life. Forgive me however if you're here and you are a believer and you choose not to heed these words you have been warned as a lost person you have been warned as a believer you are going to reject as a lost person that's on you not me but if you are here and you do admit it awesome heaven just got a little sweeter but if you are a believer and sin is in your life, I'm not saying you're going to lose your salvation. I, I don't know. I believe what God's Word said about your salvation, and it is secure. But you will answer for the sins that you have done, and I will be not held accountable for it. He told them, he said, here is your message to go. Do you know what Ezekiel's message was? It was put down the God's. Put down the gods that got you in this place where you're at. Quit worshiping the idols of wood and iron and bronze, silver and gold. Quit worshiping them and worship God. He's telling them, you're going to have to be here for a long time. So let's get right with God as we spend this time so that when we are set free, we will be ready to go back. So you know what my word to you is? Jesus is coming back. We need, we need to take God's word regardless. We need to be the watchman on the wall and be responsible, but we need to respond to the God, call of God to repent today because Jesus is coming back. In the Gospels, he repeats it over and over. In Revelation, he tells John the Revelator, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. 
I don't know how quickly he is. I realize it's been over 2,000 years, but I know a 1,000 years is a day, and a day is a 1,000 years to God. So we, what we need to do is quit trying to figure up on the calendar how many days we have to get ready. We better start getting ready right now. He will come back. The Bible tells us it is appointed for every man to die once and then the judgment. You will stand before God in judgment. One of the statements I read by those pseudo-theologians out there today is this. All roads lead to the same place. Yes, they do. They lead to the judgment of God. And you will be judged for your works as a believer or you will be judged the great white throne of judgment in Revelation, you will be judged as a non-believer. The books will be open and your name will not be found and you will be cast, and I'm going to be very frank, you will be cast into a sinner's hell for eternity where the flame burns continually, where the worm never dies, where it is outer darkness, where there is the weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'll be honest with you, that is no place I want to spend an eternity. How long is eternity? Infinity plus one more day. Do you want to spend an eternity there? God's word to you today is the same today as it was from Ezekiel. I'm no Ezekiel, I will tell you that right now. But the word is still the same. Repent and come home. Would you come and repent? Jared, what number are we singing? 308, Big Red Book. Would you turn there with me as we pray? Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for this time we come and spend at the invitation. And Lord, may we sing softly and tenderly. We sing that you're calling. But Lord Jesus, when you come to call us home, it will not be softly and tenderly. And eternity is a long time to spend separated family and friends. Lord, let your will be done in this invitation. Let us respond as you've called us to do through repentance. In your name we pray, Jesus.